Hello and welcome back. Okay, it's been a while since I've done any work on the ZX Spectrum Plus and I'm currently waiting for some PCBs for my bigger project, so now's a good time to have a play. Now in the last video I built the breakout for the ROM cartridge slot and we explored the signals and interfacing there and today I want to spend a bit of time looking at the main expansion slot and in the context of that, we're going to have a dig around at some of the underlying signals that I think are basically Z80 signals. So let's start taking a look. So here's the breakout for the ROM cartridge, and that fits into the interface 2. I do have one other thing to show you. I managed to get hold of a cartridge. Now this is actually Jetpack, the same game that we put the slightly dubious copy onto that ROM chip with. But this gives you an idea of just how simple these were. Now we saw that the pinout on these is pretty much exactly a ROM chip. We had to do some combinatorial logic because the ROM chips in here actually have extra enable lines. So we had to kind of merge those up. But this is a very simple thing. Actually, probably shouldn't do that with the device powered on. There we go. You've already seen me play this, so I won't mess around, but this potentially gives us a nice quick way to test some things. Let's have a look at this port now and design a breakout board. Now I actually designed this breakout at the same time as the ROM one, but uh, let's jump back in time to when I did that and then we'll uh, solder one up and have a play. In the EasyEDA library, I found these two items, which I think are gonna be very handy. This is the actual pads for an edge connector. And then this is the edge connector receptacle. Now I think what I'm going to do on my breakout board is have one of these at both sides, but this is actually going to be a great reference for what all the lines are. King the numbering, it just skips five for the slot. All right, I want two of those. Now I'm probably gonna to want to test all of these lines eventually, but in terms of simplicity of bringing stuff out, breaking out the address and data lines is gonna be handy. Kind of want to probe around on these video signals as well. Wonder if it would actually be possible to generate a S video signal from that with a fairly simple piece of circuitry.
Now I could go through and label all of these connections. That would be very time consuming and I don't think it gains us much. I'll have reference material on hand. Wanting to put these simple headers in has really made my life difficult here. This would have been a trivial route otherwise. Yeah, I'm just going to drop these. They're making my life hell. I'm going to keep the power though. That'll be handy. Let's order that, or more to the point, let's tag that onto another order. All right, let's take a look. It's pretty much exactly what we expected. Now I've got a hold of a couple of these edge connectors. Now these are a pin type and then these are the copper strip type. I had to modify these and I bent the copper strips slightly so I do want to make sure I've got good contact there before I start soldering. Yep, that's going to be fine. And the idea here is I try and bend the strips down so they make contact either side like that. And if that doesn't work, it's uh, back to the drawing board. As I saw on that first join, it would be very easy to not get a good connection. So I need to be very careful of these. Okay, I think connecting through is actually the exception rather than the rule here. Well, if I had to make more than one of these, I'd definitely be looking for an easier way of solving this.
That's promising at least. Looks like it might work. One looks like it doesn't make contact. And that one. Okay, looks like we've got good connections everywhere. I ended up soldering this with a little bit of a tilt on it, but that's not gonna stop us working. Now, I think I'm gonna use this style of pin. Okay, I think that's all in the right place now, so it should be just a quick soldering. get a regular two pin header here female and then we have our little breakout it's not the prettiest thing in the world but it should do the job be able to plug that straight into the back of the spectrum and uh, probe around on the connections and we've got the spare header there to plug something in and test signals in place. Right, let's uh, plug this in and have a look. Now I'm going to want to build some test interfacing circuit. So we want a breadboard. And we did put a power and ground wire in directly. That's making our life a bit easier here. Now I've already got the oscilloscope going and I think an obvious place to first look to understand the signals coming out of here would be the clock line. It's that one. Okay, well I'm seeing a clock rate of 3.37 megahertz there. I was expecting it to be fractionally higher than that. I think the documented rate is 3.5. But of course, when we looked inside there, we didn't see anything because uh, high tech is a crystal. So maybe there is a bit more variation in there than you'd expect. The other thing that does jump out to me is that clock does not look like a nice clean square wave. That is a reminder that we are sometimes quite spoiled at the quality of parts we're working with in the more modern builds. I am curious about the way there are sections of the clock that fill in the gaps underneath. That implies sometimes the clock stops on a low signal. Maybe we'll find an explanation for that later. Now something I'm very interested in looking at is the memory write. So there's a write line on the pinout and I want to take a look at it. There's actually a bunch of memory lines in a row. So I'm just going to count these up. And I believe memory write is this blue one here. Now that's more like the kind of signal we would expect. It's got um, a bit closer to some right angles on it. it. Spends most of its time high. So I'm guessing we're looking at an active low signal. That's consistent with what it says on the documentation. 
let's get the second trace up and take a look at the clock at the same time. Okay, so the duration of that right pulse seems to roughly align with a clock. Now, I also know that the Z80 performs operations in terms of four T states. And so we appear to be seeing a memory operation one in every four clocks. So that's probably consistent with that information. Now, the shape of the clock line is not a beautiful square wave, but that does look like we're high at the start of the memory op. Now, that's the right line. Next up, we've got the read line. We seem to see a lot more of that. Now, those two lines kind of exist in a very similar form on my CPU build, but something we don't have in my CPU build is the IO request and memory request lines that are next. So that's the IO request line. Now that seems to drop for longer at a time, but the complexity here says we're um, seeing a whole bunch of different uh, alignments with the clock. Let's see what memory request looks like. That's much more aligned with the clock operations. Now reading the documentation for the Z80 processor, which I believe most of these lines are preserved straight out of that, the memory request line is actually just saying that there is valid data on the address bus. So for an IO operation, we'd use the IO request. For a memory, we'd use the memory request. So both memory request and the read line or the write line being low together would actually signify a memory read or write respectively. Another line I do want to take a look at is the refresh line. Now another big difference between these old microcomputers and the CPU that I've built and other equivalent devices is the RAM we use. The SRAM I'm using my build has a nice simple operating profile. It looks an awful lot like a ROM. I just need to put the address on and the data comes out and then I've got a very simple write operation to overwrite the memory in a location. Whereas DRAM is much more complex, although it's a much simpler, cheaper piece of hardware. The memory in it decays over time, so it needs to be constantly refreshed. And the Z80 has some logic in it for refreshing. I believe this yellow line was going to be memory refresh. And what I was expecting was it was going to be similar to the read or write lines where it was active for a certain portion of the operation. All right, that looks slightly more like I'd expect. That all looks correct, but maybe just the contacts in here are a bit dirty. So that line is not behaving quite the way I'd expect, and I don't know if we're seeing the right thing or not. Um, it's possible the line doesn't come out of the back of the spectrum properly. I know on some models of spectrum, some lines weren't brought out correctly. Let's go back to looking at the memory and IO ones. It is worth holding in our head though that there are periods of time when 
the refresh is enabled that when we're just looking at the cartridge we can't necessarily tell. I will try and read up a little bit on the memory refresh line, see if I can find out any information and I'll provide it in a future video or um, possibly in the comments if I can get something quickly. So that's the memory request line. So that's all the possible uses of the address bus for memory combined together. Now I kind of think we want to narrow some of these signals down a bit. Let's actually pull out some of the address lines and start looking at some of those. Now I've made up some cables which should make life a bit easier here. And beside the clock line is the first four address lines. And the next four are further down. Could potentially have made my life a lot easier by putting separate breakouts for address and data here. These next ones are a lot more arbitrary. So I've just got single connections on these. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, I'm very curious to know if the weird groupings of these has a specific reason for it or was just convenience of the board layout. I know the high bits are used in a clever way for the keyboard scanning. The low bits I think are the ones primarily used for DRAM refresh. So the fact that they're different is uh, probably explained by that. Let's do data while we're here. So. 0, 1, 2 in a row there. 3, 4, 5, 6 swizzled up, which I've tried to uh, match here. And then the top bit is separated out from the others. This would have been so much easier if I'd put a bit more effort into the breakout board. And those are the data lines from low to high. So I've got the yellow trace on right. Let's put the purple trace onto memory request. What I want to try and do is decode a write signal. So I'm going to start off with a 74LS138, the 3 to 8 line decoder chips. Now I'm going to be quite cheeky and try and decode a write signal to the lower chunk of memory that is the ROM chip because none of the software should be doing that. So you power and ground. Okay, could be lined up better. Now I'm going to take the top three bits of the address, wire that into the three address lines of the demultiplexer. So now let's take a look at the least significant bit there. We've got active low enable, second active low, and an active high. So we should be seeing the activation here of the yellow line whenever the top three bits of the address bus are low. If that is a memory operation, that should be anything in the bottom eight kilobytes. Now that trace is still very messy. So what else can I do? Let's use the memory write line, take that to one of the active low enables. What have I done there? Ah, oh, of course. I've just put that in the wrong one, which would be forcing the line low, which probably wasn't healthy. The oscilloscope trace has stopped doing anything, which implies it's not detecting anything, which actually is exactly what we would expect because we're attempting to pick up there a write operation to the bottom eight kilobytes of memory, which is a ROM, and there's no reason for the software to do that. Apart from when I press a key, I'm seeing motion there. Right, let's write a quick piece of code. It's going to take a bit of time getting used to writing Spectrum Basic again. Let's poke 255 into address 0. So whenever I press a key, it seems to update the trace. That's a little bit different. So the yellow line is low for just one cycle. 
but if I just press a key it's low four that looks like two. Now the purple trace is the memory request line and that's not going low when I just press a key. If I run my code though it does go low. So I'm guessing if I move that to the IO operation yeah so when I press keys what I'm seeing here is a IO operation in that same range and that's going to be the ZX Spectrum ROM um, scanning the membrane keyboard. That's kind of cool. All right, I'm going to get that memory request line, feed it into a different active low enable. So now we should only react here if the top three bits of the address evaluate to zero, the memory request line is low and the write line is low. Okay, so I am no longer getting an update when I press a key. But when I run the program that does a poke into that memory region, that does update. I think we are detecting that memory right. Obviously anything in that bottom 8K is going to be triggering this, but we could narrow that down just by decoding lots more of these address lines. But we did bring the data out. Let's try and do something with that. D-type latch chip. We've used these an awful lot in the build before. Give it power and ground. Now the 574's got a single enable line there and it's got a copy line that I'm going to take from the combined selection line we're currently having on the yellow trace. All right, I've got a bunch of wires. I didn't cut these ones as special. I just rescued them from another board. So I'm gonna put those in and then line up some LEDs with them. Never guess this correctly. The LEDs were the wrong way around, I think. Oh, there we go. Plug the data bus in. That's obviously equivalent to mem data in my CPU build. That's promising. So 255 lit up all the LEDs. If we do 15, that should be the lower four. Should be the top one. I thought I saw that earlier. That looks like a memory operation. Now, I wonder if we're decoding this slightly wrong or if there is actually some situations in which the code might write to that lower portion of memory. I got an idea. Let's move to the next 8K. See if we get the same thing. Okay, we didn't get the rogue update then. We will need to change that to 8192 to be the second eight kilobytes. Yeah, that works. Okay, well, we've actually done what I set out to do here, which is just get an understanding of the way these bus signals are working. I kind of feel like that was a little bit easier than I thought it was going to be. So let's see if we can do something else that's actually a little bit more interesting. Right, so this is the UART that I built an interface to my 8-bit CPU. It's got the two 8 byte FIFOs on it for send and receive. These are the outputs to the serial port. And here's all the control lines. Data bus should be straightforward. She's probably gonna to want to disable that for now. All right, I need to look up the various lines on here. Simple obvious one, power and ground are up here. Daisy chain that as close as possible. I think there's a reset signal on the CPU somewhere, but I'm just gonna pull that line high. I'm not trying to do a full and complete interfacing of the UART. I'm just trying to get a better test that our signaling is working. Let's get all of this out. bring them all across the breadboard using a DuPont cable. The reset line we wanted to be high. Got an extra ground line there. 
bring that down. Actually, we can skip that one. We've got one down here as well. So the assert lines will pull high because they're active low. We're not going to be using those at all. And then we've got two load lines which will take data off the data bus, which is which. If I'm reading this right, that's dev 12, and we don't actually need that one at all. And that's dev 11, which will trigger a data send. Okay, let's switch this thing back on, see what happens. Okay, seeing some junk in the buffer. Oh wow, that worked. That's really cool. So I've just used the write operation to output uh, 65, which is the ASCII code for a capital A. Now I'm gonna have to test my knowledge of ZX Spectrum basic programming. I have not done much of this for a very long time. So strings were, you do a variable name followed by a dollar to designate that. Not right. Symbol shift. There you go. You all know what I'm going to do. Now, I think that should give me the length of the string. That's right. We want to loop for it instead. It's coming back a bit now. Now I need the individual character, which I think I can index like an array. Um, no square brackets. Um, that's working. Okay, what's wrong there? It's not letting me do that. Okay, I think that string operation is pulling me out string type. Is there a keyword to convert them? That looks right. Okay, so we've pulled the character out in sequence into C. If we poke it to 8192, that should give us the text out of the serial terminal. Right now, that's not worked. Let's take a look at what we're getting. I'm going to try and look at the bottom bit of the data here, see when that's changing. Data seems to change comfortably either side. Ah, that was going to be so easy. Now my data bus here does connect to a lot of things, so I'm going to try buffering the data bus. I'm using a 541 line driver here. Possibility I got the data bus the wrong way around just occurred to me, but this should solve that either way. Okay, don't be getting anything now. I pulled that active low high rather than low. No, same problem. Let's look at this differently. That H is correct. Those two slashes are where we would expect to see a double L. 
Right, so the bit pattern is not quite right. Right, so the top bit here almost shouldn't come into it at all. So you've got D012, that's the purple line, the grey line, the white line. Those are going to the right locations. Alright, so I'm working on the theory that I've got the data lines kind of um, swapped around from what they should be. Now the top bit is always zero and in both the right and the wrong data. The next three bits I've definitely got right and the bottom three bits of both the correct and incorrect letters on the output are correct. In fact, we did the zero F zero and it looked right. So the next assumption is these next four lines are wrong. The next bit along is the sixth bit. I'm putting that into orange. That looks correct. Oh, bit six. It's the second one down. The ordering of these is weird. The next one is bit five. I've got that going into... Ah. It's the grey one and it should be the red one. I think my cleverness with the pre-made cables cost me a simple win there. All right, let's try this wire. So this is the middle four bits I'm supposed to be plugging this into. So this is replacing the black through orange wires. First one is red. That's bit six. That's supposed to be the high bit where the orange was. Then bit five, then we jump to three, then four. Bingo, outstanding. Um, okay, so going after one another, so um, I can't remember if there was a renumber command on the spectrum, it'd be quite handy. Um, so 13 should be carriage return. Ten should be line feed. And you can all guess what I'm going to do next. Huh. So it's outputted a few times and then it's stopped because the spectrum wants confirmation to scroll the screen. So I just need to get rid of my print statements. There we go. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, well, I think we've proved we've uh, we've detected that memory right correctly. That's kind of fun. Okay, that was more rewarding than I expected it to be, but I really enjoyed it. And I do feel we've dug in, got a decent understanding of the signals coming out the back of the expansion port. I'm pretty sure I didn't need that extra line driver as a buffer there, although maybe it made a difference. The actual reason why all the text was messed up when I first got it going was I'd got the data lines in slightly the wrong order, which obviously corrupted the characters that I was getting sent over the serial line. Maybe a bit more testing back when I just had the LEDs would have uncovered that. But it worked and uh, we've, we've proved we can actually interface stuff into that connection. Now one thing that's very interesting is I've said I want to try and interface something via the ROM cartridge port. And to really interpret those memory operations, we needed those extra lines that are not exposed on the cartridge port. So next time I dig into this, we're gonna start experimenting and see if we can work out a way to recover the information about what memory operations are going on enough to get a data channel through to some additional circuitry. But what we've done today is really good progress and it's also given us a chance to compare the signals for memory operations between the Spectrum and the Z80 to what I've been doing on my CPU. And a lot of them are very similar. 
So thanks a lot, as always, to my patrons. I really appreciate your support. And I hope everyone found this interesting. I will see you again soon. Goodbye.